Okay, so today I'm gonna to be sharing 10 things that I don't buy or own as nutritionists. And the first one is ice cream. I'm not saying that I never have ice cream, but I just definitely do not buy it for the house because if it's there, I'm going to eat it. And I think that's pretty much true for the vast majority of us. Instead of I'm going to have ice cream, I use it as an actual treat, kind of like an outing. We'll go to one of our favorite local ice cream shops, get a scoop and really enjoy it while we're there, but not feel the need to get a whole gallon or carton worth and bring it home and have it whenever I'm feeling like I want a little something sweet throughout the day. Which if you're new here, my name's Autumn. I'm a certified clinical nutritionist with my master's nutrition human performance. On my channel, I teach you the science back tips and strategies to help you achieve your weight loss and wellness goals. So if you're new here, make sure you subscribe. Okay, the second one was maybe a little bit difficult for me to break the habit of bringing home because I'm a Southern California native and we love our chips and guacamole and that is tortilla chips. I'm not kidding, we used to always have these in our house when I was growing up and especially in college, <laughs> had a lot of tortilla chips, but it's so easy to munch on these when I'm just not even hungry. There's zero satiety factor to them because they're pretty much just pure refined carbohydrate, which means there's no protein, no fat to make me feel satisfied and just mindlessly eat more and more. Again, not saying I never have tortilla chips, but if I do have them, it's going to be at a restaurant, treating it more like a treat and not having unlimited access to it at home. The third is protein bars or our protein bars. To be honest, I wasn't ever actually super into these, but I definitely have had my fair share, especially while traveling because I thought it was higher in protein and maybe something that would be better than just grabbing a bag of chips, which there is going to be some level of betterness <laughs> to protein bars versus just tortilla chips or potato chips. But the problem is that it can still promote snacking. And that's what I noticed it was doing for me. It made it so I wasn't ever really focused on getting satiated at my meals. And instead I knew, oh, okay, I can just grab a protein bar later on. And especially when I was really struggling with a lot of gut health concerns where I was just getting excessive bloating and my belly would hurt after eating, I needed to have that break between meals to get that gut cleaning action turned on, which we've talked a lot about before. It's called the migrating motor complex. I'll put a video down below that dive into the details of that if you're curious on how that works. But by removing protein bars and putting less reliance on snacking, it gave my gut some rest and it essentially forced me to reassess my meals to make sure I was actually eating enough at my meals where I didn't need to have a snack. Okay, the fourth thing that I don't own anymore is a regular scale. A regular scale only measures weight. It does not actually measure body fat or muscle mass. And this is really important because if you're just looking at weight, this can come from your bone. It can come from your muscle. It can come from water. It can come from cutting off a limb. <laughs> Obviously don't do that. <laughs> But just to make the point, weight loss doesn't actually show you body recomposition, which is what we want. When we're talking about a weight loss goal, what we're really talking about is losing body fat and gaining muscle mass. And a scale doesn't show that. You could be losing weight, but it could be the entirely wrong way by just simply starving yourself and losing a lot of bone and muscle in the process. But it will show up as you've lost weight. But losing that bone and losing that muscle mass will end up decreasing metabolic rate, make it harder to achieve or maintain a weight loss goal in the future, and increase risk of osteoporosis osteoporosis, hip fracture, all of those things that we don't want when we're older. So instead I wanted to shift my focus onto the things that really matter. And the first time that I actually saw this was at a gym that I was going to back when I lived in LA. They had an amazing one. Oh my gosh, I love this one. It's called the InBody. If your gym has access to this, this is really one of my favorite ones to use because it not only shows you your muscle mass, your body fat percentage, but it also shows you how much muscle you have in different areas. So it'll show you like, oh, you have 12 pounds of muscle in your left arm and you have 12.5 pounds of muscle in your right? So it gives you additional information to work with if you also have some type of fitness goal. But if you don't have access to that, I also personally have the at home scale where it does show you body fat and muscle mass, but take that with a grain of salt because it's always going to be a little bit inaccurate putting that lightly, <laughs> but at least it can give you an idea of trends and it can shift your focus away from weight and what you actually want, which is body recomposition. Okay. So this is actually the at home option that I have. It's called the Arbo Leaf. I'll put a link down description below if you guys wanna check it out. It's very dusty because honestly, I haven't used this in a while because I've been using the in body instead. It looks like a normal scale, but it works by having these little metal pads right here where it has what's called bioelectric impedance, sends a signal up through your body and comes back down. So it can give an idea of how much muscle mass or body fat you have. Have it synced up to your phone and you can see history of things like, here the glare's not so great, but you can kind of see how it has a history of like body fat percentage, how it can range over time. Um, this I've found isn't entirely accurate, but again, it can kind of give you an idea. And then same thing with muscle mass. So it gives you a lot of other data. Again, not totally certain on if it's accurate, um, but it can give you pounds of muscle mass. You can see the history of it as well. 
So obviously like with muscle mass, you wanna see it going up versus going down. But again, I have seen that these aren't entirely accurate. So if you have access to something like an in-body, I would recommend using that instead. Okay, the fifth thing that I just don't buy at all anymore is bread. I might occasionally make homemade bread as a treat. In fact, for my husband's birthday recently, one of our friends makes homemade sourdough bread and she brought over a loaf for his birthday because he loves it. But just not having it be a consistent staple in our house has been such a huge one for me, particularly for getting rid of bloating. I mean, so many people are very sensitive to gluten as it is, and I don't have specific tests to prove this, but I believe that there's probably some level of gluten sensitivity for me because particularly anything wheat-based can just leave me bloated for days. But kind of like with the chips, I found that the bread also was something that I might mindlessly go to if I just felt like snacking. Maybe just make some toast with some peanut butter on it, which also would kind of fill me up from snacking times and make it so that I wasn't getting enough protein at each of my actual meals. So it was really holding me back from achieving the muscle mass goal I was looking for while also making me a lot more loaded in the process. Okay, the sixth thing that I really never buy anymore are pasta replacements. Think things like pea protein pasta or there's even ones like lentil pasta or cauliflower, putting the heavy emphasis on the quotations here, cauliflower pasta. I actually used to eat these because I was trying to stay away from some wheat-based products that were really causing me some issues with bloating. But if I was really honest with myself and when I finally was honest with myself, I realized that I still just didn't feel great eating it. Probably because of multiple issues, namely being the first one, when you have pasta as a meal, the main emphasis is going to be on pasta. It's not typically going to be on vegetables or your protein source. So you're eating a lot less of the protein needed to make you feel full and satisfied, which is what I really noticed. I was always hungry within an hour after eating pasta-based meals. And you're swapping more of the non-starchy veggies for the more variable blood glucose spiking pasta alternative. Because even a lot of the pasta alternatives still tend to use some type of refined starchy ingredient to make it taste like pasta. So it might be like tapioca starch or cap or cassava, cassava, <laughs> cassava flour. So instead now when I'm making some type of pasta inspired dish, at least for again, the vast majority of the time, because there are times when I do just want a bowl of spaghetti and meatballs. And we might go out to dinner or I might make a homemade version of that. But when I'm making it at home, I'm typically always using the zucchini alternative or spaghetti squash. Zucchini is my favorite because especially if you make zucchini noodle lasagna, you kind of like can't even tell the difference. It's amazing. Oh my gosh, if you guys haven't tried out my zucchini lasagna recipe yet, I'm going to have that linked below. It is incredible. Okay, the seventh thing that I really never buy anymore that I know is going to make a lot of people kind of angry is kombucha. I used to freaking love kombucha, like obsessed over kombucha. I remember there was a short-term ban on kombucha, at least in maybe LA or California, I'm not quite sure. Back when I was in early college, because I think they were trying to figure out the whole alcohol thing and how it's going to be regulated. And I remember when my friends found a vendor who was still selling it, but quietly selling it. And I felt like we we're in 1920s era prohibition, going and getting our secret just cases of kombucha. <laughs> but when I was drinking it daily, typically about one, maybe a half a bottle a day, I noticed that I was getting things like canker sores or breakouts. And it might be because, again, I've noticed for myself at least that I am pretty sensitive to added sugars, where when I do have added sugars, especially consistently, like after a holiday or some type of vacation, I'll get things like canker sores or breakouts. And kombucha still does have added sugar in it. And some brands can have quite a bit of added sugar. So I just try and stay clear of any drinks or liquids that have added sugar in it because I just wasn't really feeling 100%. Obviously, it's an individual case by case. Personally, I don't buy it anymore. I might have it every every now and then, but it's something that I've realized just doesn't really work for my body. The eighth thing that I just don't, I guess not really buy or own, I guess kind of own, I don't use it at least anymore, are calorie trackers. And I honestly never really use these anyway for multiple reasons. First, because depending on even just what you're eating each day, the metabolism can change a lot. For example, insulin can really suppress the metabolism by even a couple hundred calories per day. And then there's of course the sleep and stress issue, which can also greatly affect your metabolism. But another reason is because it often just suppresses overall eating, including foods that are rich in protein and fat, which both of those reduce hunger and help you to naturally just not eat as much because you're not as hungry. But there were a few times in college when I was getting my bachelor's in nutrition and dietetics that our teachers did have us track our calories or just like generally track our intake and then assess it. And I noticed that even for myself, because I was tracking, I was just overall suppressing everything that I was eating. I was starting to get hungry a lot throughout the day as a result, which led to more just small frequent snacks 
hacking, probably where a lot of the bloating issues started to come to play. And then led to me being so hungry come dinner time that if there was a bar of chocolate inside the fridge, I was going to eat that entire thing of chocolate before I ate dinner because I was really hungry. <laughs> Instead now, and pretty much ever since college, I never track any type of calories. One thing I do keep track of, at least just by making sure I eyeball correctly, is my protein intake. Because I found that once I get this settled, once I actually get enough protein for my body's needs from high quality protein sources, that I don't even crave any type of snacks. And nine out of 10 times, I don't crave any type of dessert come after dinner either. Which is something that a lot of the A and peeps have noted too. Like Corolla is one really great example where she was able to achieve her weight loss goal without counting calories. That's where the focus on satiating foods rather than just overall limiting everything can really help with the body recomposition and help to just not feel as hungry during the weight loss process. So win-win. In fact, I also did a recent video on how you can kind of eyeball your protein intake to make sure you're getting enough. Definitely make sure you check that out. I'll have it linked up here. Cause the ninth thing that I just never buy anymore are coffee creamers. This kind of goes back to my high school days when I first was drinking coffee. The only way that I could drink it was by adding in all of that French vanilla. I forget the brand, but you guys probably know what I'm talking about. The French vanilla coffee creamer where the recommended serving was I think like one tablespoon. I probably put in about half <laughs> of my coffee cup as creamer. It was more like an Arnold Palmer, but of coffee and creamer. <laughs> And those things are pretty packed with sugar, especially when you're using the amount that I was back in the day. And because I had not only the caffeine, but also the sugar, which caused a big spike and fall in my blood glucose levels, this was not great for my anxiety. Because when you get that crash in blood glucose, that's when feelings of anxiety can really start to go up. Because the body tries to get that blood glucose to come back up, and it does it by increasing our stress hormone cortisol. So since I was already prone to anxiety, these unstable blood glucose levels that were coming largely at that time from my very sweet sweet coffee with those coffee creamers. It just wasn't a good choice. So now I use things that are zero sugar, like keto coffee, or I'll do things like heavy cream and maybe with a little splash of vanilla extract, which is surprisingly so good and makes it taste almost like a vanilla latte. Okay, the 10th thing I just never buy anymore are fruit juices. In high school, I loved making smoothies, which is like, wow, I still do. <laughs> but I was making mine with a lot of orange juice. I would do just pure orange juice as the base, add in one or two bananas. I know I added in a significant amount of honey as well. All of these things are things that I talk about in my 10 smoothie mistakes video, which is why I know how much of a mistake they are because I've made them. So obviously I was getting in over a hundred grams worth of sugar from just my smoothies each morning alone, let alone the coffee creamer, mostly just creamer milkshake essentially that I was drinking. So my overall sugar intake was a lot higher, which is when I really struggled with a lot more breakouts. And my anxiety level was so much higher when I was having this higher sugar intake from all these various sources. So instead now I don't buy fruit juices. I have my fruits either whole form or I choose low sugar fruits to put into my smoothies. So things like raspberries, blackberries, strawberries, and then blueberries. I will use banana, but I'll only use about a half of a banana to keep the sugar content lower. And then instead of just making it a fruit smoothie, I'll add in protein powder, Greek yogurt, chia seeds, peanut butter to help slow the release of the sugar into the blood supply. So I don't get those really crazy ups and downs. And then of course, not using the fruit juice as the base, using unsweetened nut milks, coconut milk, almond milk, or even just water at times to really bring the sugar content down. Now, if you want to see what I eat in day as a nutritionist, you should check out this video next. Also, if you're new to my channel and you love the science backed information, make sure you subscribe right here. Come out new videos every Tuesday and Thursday. All right guys, thanks so much for tuning in and I'll see you in my next video.